I want to welcome everybody to His Glory Nation as we continue our series in the book of Romans. Tonight we will be in Romans 9. And as we always do, we pray that the Holy Spirit will come down from east to west to north to south all over His Glory Nation and be the true teacher and the living word, our Savior, Christ Jesus. With that said, let's get into Paul's, uh, Paul's epistle to the Roman church. Uh, Roman 9. Verse 1, I tell the truth in Christ, I am not lying, my conscience always bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit. So what he's saying is, I tell the, the, uh, I tell the truth in Christ. He was given the truth, Paul, by Christ, not only on the road to Damascus, which he, he denied the Christ, and he de denied the Christians, but not only did he see the, the, the living Christ, the resurrected Christ, but he was also taken into um, uh, Arabia for three years to learn the gospel, to understand the truth, understand the, the way, the truth, and the life, which is our Savior Jesus Christ. So he's saying, I am telling you the truth in Christ. He is not lying. And he says his conscience is bearing witness by the Holy Spirit. And that's what we as Christians need to be too. Telling the truth of Christ, which is the living word, his word, not man's word, God's word, Christ's word. It is the truth, the way, and the light. And also our conscience should be filled with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is our comforter. The Holy Spirit is our teacher and the word of God. And he's saying bearing witness in the Holy Spirit is what Paul is saying, that the that, that the Holy Spirit is being his conscience, keeping him clean to truth, keeping him clean to walking in the path of the living truth, which is Christ our Savior. Romans 9, 2, that I have grown sorrow and, con and, and continually grief in my heart. So he's, he's showing uh, sorrow and continued grief for his, his beloved um, brother in Israel. And this is where... Um, you really have to do a, a, a thorough search of Romans 9, 10, and 11 because Romans 9, 10, and 11, Paul is really talking about the purpose of Israel and God is not done with Israel and how God, God's people is Israel. The Gentiles are grafted in by grace uh, through a loving God, but God's people are Israel, have been Israel, and that is biblical Israel. Those are the Israel Israelites that will... Um, open up their heart and receive the true Messiah, the one Messiah, Jesus Christ, and they will have a second chance. So this is really hammering down on a unfortunate thing that's going through most denominations. I would say nine out of ten denominations are teaching this today, and this is, uh, this is false teaching. It's called replacement theology or amillennialism, and what that's saying is that it, it, the the New Testament is more or less, especially the book of Revelation, is, is an allegory. And that the church has replaced Israel. And that is heresy. That is absolute apostasy. And Paul, in the, in the New Covenant here in Romans 9, 10, and 11, if you read this through its totality and you read exactly what he's saying, he's saying the complete opposite of what these false denominations are teaching today. Remember, our teacher is the Word of God. Our teacher is the Holy Spirit, not man's denomination, because man's denomination will steer you wrong every time. We need to be transformers, not conforming to man's teaching. We, we transform to the living God, and that is Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit and the Scriptures exactly the way they say in the totality. We don't change the words. And Paul is going in great detail on how God still has a plan for Israel. And Israel still has a everlasting covenant with God. And that's the purpose of the Davidic covenant. That's the purpose of the millennial reign when Jesus Christ comes back and sits on his father's throne in the flesh, King David, for a thousand years. That is to fulfill the Davidic covenant. He has an everlasting covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob for the land. That's everlasting Israel, the Israelites still have a purpose in God's future. And the Gentiles, we are blessed to be grafted in and be called children of God. So let's, as Paul will, will, will say in Romans eleven twenty five, let's not be ignorant, brethren, in saying that there is no place for Israel. There certainly is a place for Israel. And this is why he's crying, he's, he's in deep, he's in, in grief in his heart, is because the majority of his fellow Jewish people have had a hardened heart to God. 
And he wishes, and I'll finish it as the scripture says in Romans 9, 3, for I could wish that I myself was a curse from Christ for my brethren, my countrymen, according to the flesh. He says he wished he could take all the burden upon him so that they could get it and realize that he is the living Christ. He is the Messiah that the Israelites missed the first time. But the scripture says the remnant of Israel will, re- will, will in their affliction, will receive him the second time. And today there's more Jewish people coming to the Messiah, Jesus Christ, than any time in the history. Matter of fact, there's a couple of prominent r- rabbis, um, one that just died in uh, uh, Kaduri, who uh, put the letter in that he saw the Messiah before his death, and after a year was over, he revealed that it was the Messiah, which caused a lot of controversy uh, controversy in in um, religious or Judaism, Israel. Um, but more and more people are seeing the truth, and that is the blood of Jesus Christ. Romans 9, 4. Who are Israelites to whom per- pertain the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the service of God, and the promises? So he's telling all the things that were given to Israel. Romans 9, 5. And, and whom are the fathers and from whom, according to the flesh? Christ came who is over all, the eternal blessed God. Amen. Saying it came through the the little genealogy of the Jewish line, through the tribe of Judah, through David, through the Messiah, Jesus Christ. Romans 9, 6. But it's not for the word of God has taken no effect, but they are not all Israel who are of Israel. Meaning that Israel secular versus Israel that gets it, understands the, the, the Lord's heart. Again, back in the day of the Lord in the first covenant, God did not want the laws. He didn't want your works. He didn't want your sacrifices. He wants your heart. And few prophets realize that. And um, sad that the, you know, Jeremiah is the weeping prophet and just weeped that his people wouldn't understand the love of Jehovah God, how he wanted to have a love relationship with them. And they got caught up in the works. They got caught up in the sacrifices and, and, and worship other gods. The priest, in the times of uh, Jeremiah and Ezekiel, um, w- w- what they would do is they would go in and they had lockers outside of the temple. And they would put their false gods into their lockers and then put on their priestly garments and go in and give the, the priestly works. It wasn't of the heart because once they were done, they'd go back and take their idols and go back with them. So God sees the heart. He sees our actions. He knows what we're going to do. And he wants our heart. He doesn't want the works. He doesn't want us going through the motion. He wants an agape relationship. Romans 9, 7. Nor are they children because they are the seed of Abraham. But in Isaac your seed shall be called. So he's talking about Isaac will be the fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant it's through that flesh that genealogy that is those who are the children of the flesh these are not the children of god but the children of the promise are counted as a seed so he's saying the children of the flesh just because you're the children of the flesh and you don't receive the lord with an agape heart you're not the one of the promise remember the promise went through uh, isaac and jacob isaac and jacob had a love relationship with god the father They knew him. They loved him. They honored him. They obeyed him. They went through trials and tribulations like we all do, but they had an agape relationship and they walked with the Lord. Romans 9, 9, for this is the word of promise. At this time I will come and Sarah shall have a son. Romans 9, 10, and not only this, but when Rebekah also conceived by one man, even by our father Isaac, to the children not yet being born or not having done or good or evil, the purpose of God according to election might stand not of works but of him who calls. It was said to her, the older shall serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. So he's talking about before we were even, the world was even, uh, came to fruition, before we were even in our mother's womb, election took place. And this causes a huge theological debate. Is it election? Is everything preordained or do we have free will? The answer is God is outside of the time domain, so both are true. Meaning, we were elected and called before the beginning of time because God saw what our free will, what we would do with our heart. So therefore, we could be called elected and we could also have free will. Because God is outside of the time domain, knowing the begin and the end. He knew before we were even conceived. He knew from the beginning of the earth what our choice would be from our heart. Do we love him with every ounce of our soul, 
our spirit and our mind as the first and best commandment according to Jesus Christ? Or do we deny him? And if so, we were elected. God elected us. And it's a beautiful thing. Romans 9, 14. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? Certainly not. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whoever, whomever I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whomever I have compassion. And he's quoting uh, Exodus 33, 19 there, and say, showing that God is a sovereign God. He's the creator of all things. He will have mercy on whom he wants mercy. He'll have compassion on who he wants to have compassion. Yes, we have free will. Yes, he's a loving God, and he judges us by our heart and our intent of our heart, but he can do whatever he wants. He's God. But luckily, we don't have an untrustworthy God or a God that changes his stripes. We have a God that's holy. We have a God that's true. We have a God that has shown us his precepts, his commandments, how to be obedient, how to have a agape relationship with him, how to walk with him, how to please him. The only way to please him is through the heart, our heart, giving our heart up to him through his son and our savior, Jesus Christ, and being obedient to his word. And he will have compassion and mercy on who he likes. So then it's not of him who wills, nor of him who runs, but of God who shows mercy. Yes, God, we, we pray for God's mercy, not for God's judgment, because we don't want God's judgment, because we are all of the sin nature, and we all deserve death. We've all fall short, glory of the, fall short of the glory of God. We pray for his mercy, not for his judgment. Because even those who are still in a sin nature, in a iniquity nature, we as brothers and sisters have to gather, pray for those people, because we don't want them. We don't want anyone to be, turned, to be damned to hell forever. We pray for each and every lost soul that they'll find the living God through the blood of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Romans 9, 17, For the scripture says to Pharaoh, For this very purpose I raised you up, that I may show my power in you, and my name be declared in all the earth. So he used a, a, a pagan god, a pagan ruler in Pharaoh. He did that with uh, many, Cyrus and Darius and uh, Artaxerxes, and, uh, and one that uh, I believe became a believer in Jesus Christ, and that's Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. He has his own testimony in Daniel 4. Daniel 4 is the testimony of Nebuchadnezzar giving glory to Jehovah God, the one God, the true God, the only God. Romans 9, 18. Therefore he has mercy on whom he wills, and whom he wills he hardens. Who, you will say to me then, why does he still find fault? For who has resisted his will? But indeed, O oh man, who are you to reply against God? Will the thing that formed say to him who formed it, why have you made me like this? Again, God, he's saying God is a sovereign God. And the same thing that Job said. Um, Job, Job, if we study the, the, the story of Job, Job uh, uh, finally relented and said, you're the God of the universe. You can do whatever you want to do. You're the potter, I'm the clay. And we have to relent to God. He, he, has, he has us in the palm of his hand. We are the clay. He is the molder. But we got to remember one key phrase that we learned, uh, one key verse is the why. And we get that why in Romans 8, 28. For we know, we don't guess, we know that all things, not some things, all things work to the good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. That's why we need to highlight that in our Bibles. We know that if we're called and we love God according to his purpose and we're obedient, no matter what happens in the world, the hardening or the, the circumstances, he's got it, and it is going to be better for us. He knows us better than we know ourselves. Romans 9.21, does not the potter have power over the clay for the, the, the same lump to, to make one vessel to honor another dishonor? What if God, wanting to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath prepared for destruction, meaning he could do whatever he wanted. If he wanted to call the earth into destruction and to wipe out everyone right now, he could. But we know he wouldn't because we know his heart. And we know his heart by seeking his face, getting into his word, getting into prayer, and being obedient. The more we do that, the more he shares with us, and the more we fall in love with him and know what a great and glorious God we have. 
praise his holy name. Romans 9.23. And that he might make known the riches of his glory. Oh, how beautiful is that? On the vessels of mercy, which he had prepared before, beforehand for glory. His vessels of mercy, the riches of his glory. He does it all for the riches of his glory and gives us mercy. And pray for the mercy, not the judgment, which he's prepared beforehand for glory. Praise God. Romans 9, 24, even us whom he called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. So he's saying again, the Gentiles here are grafted in. And he's going to quote Hosea 2, verse 23 here. And he also says in Hosea, I will come to them, my people, who are not my people, and, are, and her beloved, who is not beloved. He's talking about his people, the Gentiles. He's talking about his people, the church. We are the bride. Christ is, is the groom. We are, we are united in agape love with him forever once we accept him as our Lord and Savior and walk in his precepts. So we're, he, talked to, he talked to the prophet Hosea way back in the Old Testament to share this mystery, the mystery of the church, the mystery of the Gentiles being grafted in of those uh, of, of, of mercy. Because of his mercy, we were giving, given his glory by accepting his son, Jesus Christ, as our Lord and Savior. And 9.26, he's quoting Hosea 1, verse 10. And it shall come to pass in the place where it was said to them, You are not my people. There they shall be called sons of the living God. Think about that. Through the blood of Jesus Christ, all the Gentiles who are not of the line, who are not of the bloodline, have been grafted in because of the mercy of the Lord all the way back to the Old Testament. Jesus Christ was on the, every single page of the Old Testament. We just needed to know where to look for him. And we're going to see it here in Isaiah when he's going to talk about the stone that, they, that Israel stumbled over. Romans 9.27, and Isaiah also cries out concerning Israel, quoting Isaiah 10, verse 22 and 23. Though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, the remnant will be saved. So he's saying, here in the end times, there is a plan for Israel. And the remnant, not secular Israel, biblical, godly Israel that accepts Jehovah God, Jesus Christ as their Messiah, which they will the second time, and which many Jews are today, accepting Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And they will be saved. Again, the remnant. Remnant's a small group, small small number my belief it's 10 percent and and isaiah said that in 10 uh, isaiah 10 verses 22 and 23 now 9 28 finishes the uh, 23 uh, isaiah 10 23 for he will finish the work and cut it short in righteous righteousness because the lord will make short work upon the earth meaning his glory will come upon the earth and his will will be done and he will usher in the reign of our Messiah, Jesus Christ, the Davidic covenant for a thousand years, and then everlasting agape love with God the Father, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit with all the prophets and the saints and all the believers in Jesus Christ our Lord forever. We go back to the time of the Garden of Eden where, where God the Father, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit began before the word because Christ is the word. What, their, what, what the Trinity's first initial objective was, was for every single person to ever be born, to live in harmony and love, agape love, with the Most High God through His Son, Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, and God the Father. Praise God. And now Romans 9.29, this is Isaiah 28, verse 16. And, I, and as Isaiah said before, unless the Lord of the, the Sabbath had less, left us a seed, that seed is Jesus Christ. We would have become like Sodom and we would have been made by Gomorrah. So God knew from the beginning of time, even through Isaiah the prophet, that the seed, the seed of the woman, back to Genesis 3, the seed of the woman, which is biologically incorrect, the seed is with a man, but the seed of the woman, who is Christ the Lord, would be our redemption, would be our mercy through God the Father. Romans 9.30 well, what shall we say then, that the Gentiles who do not pursue righteousness have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness of faith, of faith? But Israel, pursuing the law of righteousness, hasn't attained to the law of righteousness? Why? Because they did not seek it by faith. He's saying it's by faith. But as if it were 
by the works of the law. See, God is, again, Paul is saying in 931 and 932, it is not by, you don't get righteousness by the law, by pursuing the law, because we will all fall short of the law. We all fall short of the glory of God. Christ in the Beatitudes put the standards the Beatitudes were to a Christian audience, to believers in Jesus Christ, and he put the bar so high that no human being could possibly do that in the flesh. It is not until we go home and get our resurrected body with Christ the Lord and we're with him with eternity will we have no more DNA sin nature. We are S-I-N positive through our DNA as long as we are in the earthly flesh. Even though we are Christians, that's why the Christian bar of soap is so important. Our sins are forgiven. That is Isaiah. Isaiah says, your sins will be as scarlet, but they washed as white as snow. That happens when you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you walk your walk. But we'll fall, we will fall during that walk, and that's where we pick ourselves up. In 1 John 1, 9, the Christian's bar of soap, again, highlight this in your Bibles. It says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins and purify, purify us from all unrighteousness. And that's exactly what Paul is talking about here. We get righteousness by faith, not by the law. And the stum in Romans 32, I'll repeat again. Why? Because they did not seek it by faith, but as it were, by the works of the law. For they stumbled at the stumbling stone. And that stumbling stone is Christ. That's what they stumbled over. It's only through the blood of Christ. And as it is written, and as it is written, this is Isaiah 28, 16, Behold, I lay in Zion, meaning his holy mountain, his holy city, Jerusalem, where Christ the Lord will reign forever on his father's throne, King David, fulfilling the Davidic covenant that Israel has a place in history and everlasting. Zion is a stumbling stone, a rock of offense, and whoever believes on, believes on him will not be put to shame. So Isaiah, way back when, is talking about the stumbling stone, the rock of offense, and who believes on him will not be put to shame. He's talking the rock. The rock is Christ. Remember constant, expositional constancy that the Holy Spirit is always consistent with its symbols throughout the entire scripture. A stone or a rock is always Jesus Christ. This is Jesus Christ being told by Isaiah the prophet all the way back, all the way back to Isaiah 28, 16. And he says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. We won't put to be put to shame. We'll have everlasting life with Jesus Christ, God the Father, and the Holy Spirit. That's the end of Romans 9. Praise God. I pray that this has been a, a wonderful uh, experience, that the Holy Spirit has come down upon you, show you that God is um, merciful, He's wonderful, but He also has the will of the world in His hands. He can do what He wants when He wants. But thank God we know our God by getting in the Word and that He loves us. And he does everything according to his scripture. And he does everything if you are a believer, again, Romans 8, 28, for our good if we're called for his will and we love him. And with that said, if there's anybody on this broadcast tonight that hasn't accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you look at, this, look at the world today. The world is in complete meltdown. The time of his coming is imminent. We have the stock markets in all of the countries bleeding and crashing as I speak this, this message today. Nations are at war like no other time in history. We need our Savior today. Satan's favorite day is tomorrow. Don't put off to the day to find and accept Jesus Christ. For those who have not accepted Jesus Christ, I ask you to pray this prayer with me. Jesus, you're my King, my Lord. I repent of my sins, and I know you're the way, the truth, and the life, the only way to heaven. And I believe, according to the scriptures, that you're the living word. You died on the cross for me. And after three days, arose again to sit at the right hand of the Father. And soon you're coming back. I give you my life. I trust in you. And I want to be obedient to you. In Jesus' name. You prayed that prayer. You have everlasting life with the most high God through the Son, the second of the Godhead, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. May the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob bless you until Romans 10. God bless.